So, good evening and uh, welcome to our keynote lecture of this uh, uh, retreat uh, in Corona times and uh, online, in an online version. It's uh, 8 p.m. in Kiel, it is uh, 9 a.m. in Hawaii, and it is uh, noon in Oregon. And it's a great pleasure not only to re-welcome the members of our CRC, and uh, we are nearly completely here to, to listen to the keynote lecture, but it's also a great pleasure to welcome the students of our BioCenter, which are taking part in that lecture as a part of their Biologische Colloquium seminar series. It's a great uh, pleasure that Katrina uh, Grundlach is here, a postdoc from Margaret. She's currently in Leiden. It's wonderful that an advisory board member, uh, Karen Guyemin, is uh, listening from, from Oregon. And we have fellows from the Studienstiftung here, which are invited by Philipp Rosenstiel uh, also to join us. So it seems that this evening is have something interesting to, to bring to us. And it's, m of course, uh, most important to say welcome, but probably good morning to Margaret McFall uh, Nye in Hawaii. She is our keynote speaker tonight. Uh, Margaret uh, is director of the Pacific Biosciences Research Program and uh, professor of the Cavallo Marine Laboratory at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. It's not really necessary to us to introduce her, but uh, thinking of the students which are now joining us, I think it's necessary to say that Margaret McFall is uh, one of the leaders, if not the leader, uh, in the field of the role of beneficial microbes in health and uh, disease. She uses a binary symbiosis between squid bacterial interactions to study in general rules, concepts of animal microbiomes. And this has expanded our view of the role of beneficial microbes enormously. Besides that, Margaret is heavily involved in promoting microbiology at the uh, cornerstone, in, as the cornerstone in the field of uh, biology. Uh, she is uh, trying to and doing very successfully integrating macrobiology and, and microbiology into a single unified field. Um, she was scholar in Caltech, uh, and uh, she was a Moore scholar there. She was a Guggenheim fellow in 2012. That was important because Margaret McFall used the Guggenheim money or part of the Guggenheim money to sponsor a meeting in the, um, in the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center in Durham. And the outcome of this um, meeting was a PNAS paper, Animals Living in a Microbial World. I just checked, this paper currently is cited 1,555 times and uh, tells you that that meeting was a breakthrough, uh, a change, a paradigm sh uh, shifting event and uh, it was an important uh, point telling that beneficial microbes play an important role in biology and evolution in medicine. Margaret is a member of the um, Academy of Microbiology, American Academy of Arts. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, professor. Last but not least, we should never forget we, the CRC 11A2 in Kiel, that she is the founding mother of our CRC. Margaret and Eugen Rosenberg and his wife Ilana came to Kiel a long time before we had this center in a brainstorming meeting and they helped us to shape the ideas to get the structure of this CRC. As soon as this CRC was funded by the German Science Foundation, Margaret McFall joined our, uh, our advisory or scientific advisory board. She, re she uh, participated in our retreat in 2018 in Schleswig which was crucial for shaping a successful application for a funding phase two of um, our CRC. Thank you. Dankeschön, Margaret. Thank you also uh, for talking to us tonight and uh, to talk about a new and a hot topic and the title and uh, it's now, the floor is now open to Margaret and she will share 
her screen. The title of the talk is Activity Between and Among Symbiont Strains, Communicating with the Host Across a Complex Biogeographic Landscape. Margaret, very much looking forward to your talk. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Thomas for this phenomenal opportunity. Um, I am stuck here in the Mid-Pacific Gyre, so it's wonderful to think about communicating with friends and colleagues on the other side of the world. Um, it's just such um, a great adventure, uh, I think, for all of us to be given the gift to work in this field that's so frontier. And uh, it's exciting to see all the wonderful things that have come out of the Meta Organisms group. But today what I'd like to talk to you about um, is the system that I work on here in Hawaii as an example of um, a set of conserved properties in symbiosis. And in this first slide here, you see the Kiwala Marine Lab where we work. And uh, actually I'm talking from down here. And this is uh, myself and Ned Ruby out collecting in the field. And this is how we collect uh, the animal that I'm gonna talk about uh, in the evening in the shallow sand flats of the Hawaiian archipelago. Uh, as many of you know, there are experimental models that are developing for symbiosis. Uh, evolution has done phenomenal experiments, and I'm showing some of them here, and many of them you are familiar with. Uh, and today, I'm going to be talking about this little guy here, the bobtail squid. So the bobtail squid uh, is one of the animals that uh, has... Uh, a horizontally transmitted symbiosis. And many of the models that I showed you in the previous slide also have uh, horizontally transmitted symbioses. Uh, and they have to establish, they have to recruit bacteria or their symbionts from the environment that the system undergoes development typically, and then it comes to a stable situation. And so I'm gonna be talking about how this quickly happens uh, in the squid vibrio system. So for those of you who are not familiar, I'm just gonna give some very brief details on the mature symbiosis. So this little casual guy um, is small. As you can see, he's, his mantle length is only a couple of centimeters. And um, <clears throat> they live in the shallow sand flats of the Hawaiian archipelago. They're night active predators and they come out and um, forage at night. And when they forage at night, they use the, the, luminous, the luminescence of their symbiont, Vibrio fisheri. And that symbiont is housed in this complex bilobed light organ in the center of the mantle cavity. And so uh, deep inside that organ on each side are three independent crypts and the bacteria reside extracellularly along the apical surfaces of the epithelia of these crypts. And it's kind of eye-like, it has all these structures around it so that it can emit light ventrally uh, matching moonlight and starlight so it doesn't cast a shadow against the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So it's a kind of camouflage. So the reason we like studying this symbiosis and why we were attracted to it is that it's a natural binary system that is just one host and one microbe naturally occurring with the animal. <clears throat> and so what it allows one to do is drop into the conversation that a host has with its symbiont with very, very high resolution and understand their conversation. I love this very old movie called My Dinner with Andre. Um, and these two guys over the space of this um, hour and a half movie, you really get to understand who they are and what their motivation is. And I compare this to the beautiful Kumbh Mela celebration in India, where it's usually there are about 110 million, million Hindus who get together um, and um, trying to figure out the motivation of any one of those and how they work as a whole is a very, very difficult situation. And I liken that to the, um, the, the human or mammalian gut. The other reason why we like the system is because we have what I call precision genetics uh, in, the, in the situation. And that is very well-developed uh, uh, genetics in Vibrio fisheri. And it allows us to say, okay, this, is, this particular gene is, is essential for colonizing the animal. How does the animal respond when you make a mutation in that specific gene? It doesn't affect anywhere else in the body, just that specific place uh, in the host. 
And um, a couple of host genetics are underway. They've begun to do a little bit of genetics with Euprimnoscolopes at MBL, and um, other people are working on that as well. So we're hopeful that we'll have genetics in both partners, and that will be one of the only animals with, where you have genetic in all part, genetics in all partners. The basic big question that we ask are, what are the conserved mechanisms underlying the chronic colonization of animal epithelia by gram-negative bacteria? And this is probably one of the most common, if not the most common ways in which bacteria associate with animal cells. And so um, here is the vertebrate um, mucociliary uh, bronchial epithelium, and here's the microvillous intestine. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a surface epithelium and the crypt epithelium, which are both uh, very similar. These are highly conserved features across anim um, the animal kingdom. And what we wanna know is we wanna know about how, how tissues capture specific bacteria along these surfaces. So I'm gonna give you a little, um, uh, milestones of the colonization. So this is like a little primer so that you get the whole picture and then I'm gonna go into each thing. So the babies hatch from eggs after about 18 to 20 days of embryogenesis and they have a little nascent light organ. And then they begin to pump the water across the light organ, across these, I'm gonna talk about these little ciliated fields that are juvenile specific fields and they pump water past this. And the thing that's important to remember, and I'm gonna mention it several times, is that Vibrio fisheri is only typically a thousand or fewer bacteria against a background of 10 to the sixth nonspecific bacteria in the bacterial plankton. So they represent 0 0.05 to 0.1%. Within three hours, the animal is able, to, is able to pull its symbiont out of that background and remember, this guy's really small. He's only a millimeter, this baby, and the mantle cavity is about a microliter. And so in any given in, in, uh, inspiration, one might expect a single bacterial cell to be in there. And within three hours, they're able to get a group of them in there. Once they gather, then they migrate into tissues and then they grow out and by 12 hours, they induce an irreversible morphogenesis that causes the um, loss of the ciliated surfaces on here that are responsible for the recruitment event. So they go into the light organ and they signal to the surface, you're colonized, you can now undergo morphogenesis. And this is what it looks like at about four days. At the same time, at about 12 hours, they, their first circadian rhythms um, associated with the symbiont, symbiosis are induced. And this is really amazing because um, they, they undergo this diel rhythm absolutely right away. And it's, it requires the bacteria be present and it requires that the bacteria be making light. And then there's a maturation stage that I won't have time to talk about that uh, today, but it undergoes um, a change such that there's a really deep um, uh, uh, circadian rhythm in the metabolism of the symbionts. So one of the things we're gonna talk about now is this weird juvenile light organ with these ciliated surfaces. And here's an aggregate that's formed. It will go into the light organ um, through down a long, what we call migratory path through a bottleneck here, and then it will um, grow out. And I'm showing one of the three crypts on each side. And so, all of these steps that happen here occur across only 150 microns, which is 75 body lengths of the animal. And during that time, excuse me, of the bacteria, during that time, um, the Vibrio fisheri goes through six completely different biophysical and biochemical environments until it finally resides here. So there's a tremendous talking back and forth between the host and the symbiont. And it's just amazing. They come down and finally reside in the crypts. And in, I should say, in the absence of Vibrio fisheri, nobody else colonizes this organ. So the challenge then is to recruit the specific symbiont at the exclusion of all others in the bacteria plankton in this short period. So what are the recruitment steps? So let's look at this ciliated surface. 
So um, I had the pleasure of having a collaboration with um, uh, Ava Kanso and Yana Nauroth. And I know Yana, many of you must know Yana by now. She's doing a collaboration with, with uh, Tomas's lab. And what they showed is that um, the organ, uh, the light organ is subject to two flow regimes, both at low Reynolds numbers. In other words, it's a very viscous environment. So when you look at the, the um, water that's being pumped in and out, what they showed is that there's very, there theoretically is very, very little exchange. And when Yana looked at the light organ and the way the light organ handles particles in the surrounding seawater, she found that the light organ behaves exactly the same when it's in the mantle cavity as it does out when it's extracted out of the mantle cavity. It collects the particles the same way. And these data suggested that all of the activity um, is the result, or all of the, the pulling in of, of symbionts is the result of the activity of these ciliated fields here. Now, what are the biophysical characteristics of the ciliated field? So Yana's focused on looking at particles and you can see the metacrinal beat on the cilia on the outside. So cilia on the surface, on the very outside, um, uh, function to, to, uh, to entrain water uh, into what uh, an area of short cilia, uh, which is a stagnant zone. So that these, the activity of these long cilia is to force bacteria into an area of very low mix, a very low um, act, um, flow uh, right above the pores. And um, these guys, uh, you can see the metacrinal beat here uh, along this SEM. So if you look at, uh, this is something actually that Katrina did, and I'm gonna talk about her work in a minute. But um, what you can see in this chymograph, um, you can look at this, uh, determine the ciliary beat frequency, and you can see that these long cilia have this, these, this beautiful pattern that is measurable, and the short cilia have no pattern. They're, they're, um, the ciliary beat of the short cilia is random, as though they're mixing uh, the, the fluid above the pores. So what um, uh, Yana actually found was that there is this particular field, if you give it a set of fluorescently labeled particles, here's the ciliated field and the pores are right in this region, that they, this, the activity of this field will collect particles of two microns, preferentially at the exclusion of smaller and larger particles. And two microns is about the size of the symbiont. So that was, that was very cool. So there's a biomechanical selection that's going on there. And so um, at the end of her study that she had a beautiful paper in PNAS, she concluded that there are two modes of ciliary behavior that serve different functions. One is sorting the bacteria-sized particles into this region around the pores, or what she called the staging zone, and then mixing around the pores. So then Katrina Goodluck um, came into the lab and began to study what happens under natural conditions. This is where biophysics meets biochemistry. As I mentioned, um, Yana found that two micron particles are selected. Well, most of the bacteria in the seawater are two microns. So there has to be something else going on. But what happens is, watch this little guy right here. You can see that um, there he hatches out. And within 30 seconds of hatching out, um, what happens is he begins, um, the cilia on the surface uh, begin to beat. So what happens is, then, is in, within minutes, Spencer Nyholm working in my lab, um, showed that um, within minutes, mucus, copious amounts of mucus in, in orange here, shed from the surface of, of the light organ. And um, there's, there are biochemical characteristics that begin immediately pulling out certain types of bacteria. So this, we, the mucus we found was full of nitric oxide and certain antimicrobials. This is a peptidoglycan recognition protein, lysozyme and, and phenyl oxidase. 
um, much of this is anti-gram positive. Gram, gram positive bacteria never associate with the tissues. What's more is there's a change. The seawater pH is about 8.2. By the time you get to the pores, it's just above six. And there's a huge salinity change. Uh, squid tissue is typically about 1,275 milliosmoles. So what happens here is the symbiont undergoes a very quick transition from a, a 200 fold change in hydrogen ion concentration and about a 25% increase uh, in uh, or change in osmolarity. So this is an amazingly um, shaping environment. So how does the ciliated field respond to this? So here's Katrina and she's on the call here. And, and as Thomas mentioned, she's now in Ariana Briegel's lab um, at Leiden, who's we're continuing to work on, um, on these, these various issues uh, with, with Ariana's lab. So what, how Katrina has been analyzing this is she photographs the cilia as they're beating and, and determines the ciliary beat frequency um, based on, on an analysis uh, like such as this. And so you can see that um, this is an aposymbiotic animal, which means a non-symbiotic. And this is a symbiotic animal. And you can see that these are pretty uniform um, patterns across the field. These outer cilia are the, the cilia that are beating really quickly. And these inner cilia are the ones that are beating randomly. But across the field, there's a pretty um, consistent uh, increase in ciliary beat frequency. She had put these in unfiltered seawater, which contains those 10 to the 6 non-symbiotic bacteria, and with lots of peptidoglycan shed. But she wanted to ask the question, what is the influence of the peptidoglycan? So she had to use filter sterilized seawater. And what she did was she took um, the control was filter sterilized seawater with lysozyme, which was to break down this peptidoglycan into fragments. And she showed that when you expose the animal to peptidoglycan alone, you got um, not only a huge amount of mucus shedding, but you got a huge increase in ciliary beat frequency. Now that's a little bit counterintuitive because you would think mucus shedding would slow the cilia down, but no, it increases ciliary beat frequency um, by, um, and so what is it about the peptidoglycan? that we were really curious, what is it? And as I mentioned, the peptidoglycan is full of nitric oxide and nitric oxide is known to increase ciliary beat frequency. So Katrina next went after looking at whether or not it might be the nitric oxide that's in the uh, mucus. Well, this is, a, this is to show that there's shedding of nitric oxide containing vesicles out with the mucus. And what Katrina did was she added peptidoglycan and you got the typical ciliary beat frequency, but when she added peptidoglycan with um, a, um, a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, SMTC, she got a reduction um, in the uh, ciliary beat frequency, a significant reduction. And so that was a suggestion. She also tried a nitric oxide scavenger, and although not statistically significantly different um, from the uh, peptidoglycan alone, it did pull it down a little bit, continuing to suggest that nitric oxide was important. And then when she added a nitric oxide donor, um, it, she got a, a bit of an increase that was statistically significantly different from the control. So it appears that at least nitric oxide in the environment increases the ciliary beat frequency um, by about 20%. And it looks like that's at least one of the things that's very likely to be important in the increase in ciliary beat frequency that occurs right away. So the other thing that Katrina wanted to know was when you put the animal in unfiltered seawater, it has a lot of peptidoglycan and you get this huge increase in ciliary beat frequency. Um, and, and this is in a non-symbiotic animal. And she wanted to know what happens if you add Vibrio fisheri at the, at the levels which it normally colonizes to that um, uh, unfiltered seawater situation. And it was shocking. The animal is extremely sensitive to the presence of the symbiont. So here's the aposymbiotic animal in unfiltered seawater 
If you add 500 cells per mil of Vibrio fisheri um, in 30 minutes, you get a statistically significant increase in ciliary beat frequency. This, we, we just absolutely couldn't believe it. We did every control known to man. She did the, the, um, the media loan. She did a whole bunch of different things just to make sure that, that this was correct. Because, I mean, back to the fact that there's probably a single bacterial cell that's sampled and then released and sampled and released um, over this 30 minutes. I mean, it's just really, truly remarkable. So what she found was when she looked at her chymographs of, of this situation, um, uh, this is what she sees. Um, what she saw, um, let me go back, um, when she was looking at, at this, um, she saw the typical chymograph, um, but she wanted to know what, what could possibly be causing this. Well, in her work on chymographs, she had seen that uh, tracheal cytotoxin, which is um, a bacterial cell wall toxin, causes a very chaotic, um, it really disturbs the pattern that you typically see. You get a lot of variance across the field. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what might be causing these 500 cells per minute, what they might be doing. And this TCT has a very, very high specific activity but it would have to be presented to the cells. So they have to at least stick transiently. So she tried a bunch of the pili, uh, mutants of the pili, which are little things that stick out of the bacterial cells, which cause them to attach to the host, even transiently. And one of the pili called pill T had this really disrupted um, ciliary bead frequency. And so when she looked at that by variance, you can see that an aposymbiotic or a symbiotic animal has very little difference um, in the variance across the field. But if you look at the pill T, it's hugely changed. She could pull that down a little bit um, with a pill T uh, complement, but not entirely. So this is amazing. This animal is super sensitive um, to its symbiont, which is just remarkable to me. One of the um, former postdocs in the lab, Sabrina Kohler, there at University of Kiel, I know you know, a lot of you know um, Sabrina, she did a phenomenal study on strain variation. And what she did was she looked at two hours post-colonization at, at, or post-exposure to symbionts, and there are two different behaviors, of two major different behaviors. One is in the bacterium we've studied a lot. These guys make small aggregates and hang out outside and get um, get primed to colonize. And then there are these. There's this group we call the sharing, the uh, dominant strain. Huge aggregates. They form huge aggregates, and they go in. They colonize right away, sort of throwing themselves on the barbed wire. It's just a remarkable study. And this is one of my favorite pictures because remember you have this, this um, pad here. And what Sabrina showed that it was that she could capture um, the dominant strain sometimes that would just be associating with this pad of cells. Um, but what Katrina did was she compared these two types of strains and showed Sabrina that strain variation does not affect ciliary beat frequency even when you have these huge numbers of bacteria around which was, we were very surprised about that actually. So then what happens? Okay, you get this ciliary beat frequency and training the bacteria above the pores and the, they form a very small aggregate typically, um, the, at least the, that one strain type, uh, very small um, aggregates. What Melissa showed was that they um, attach to the, to the um, cilia um, and um, in doing, in attaching to the cilia, um, what they do is they, um, they signal to the host. And you can see this because they cause hemocytes to traffic into this region. Well, we decided to do um, a, a comparison of the gene uh, expression in animals that had and hadn't been, or the aposymbiotic animal, that had, a, had no aggregating bacteria, of course, because Vibrio fisheri wasn't present, with five Vibrio fisheri cells. 
And so we, what we saw, um, this was a great postdoc, um, uh, Natasha Kramer, who worked in my lab, and she went over and worked with Phil Rosenstiel. And what they showed was that um, the host genes are regulated specifically across the 10,000 cells of the light organ by five Vibrio fisheri cells on average attaching to the cilia. And this whole attachment changes the game. At that point, Vibrio fisheri, what happens is, is that there's selection, the selection, there's a pouring out of more antimicrobials. And the idea is that Vibrio fisheri is able to adapt to that cocktail and other bacteria are not. The other thing that is in the mucus is polymeric chitin. And that's broken down by a chitinase whose expression upon that attachment is upregulated and it breaks the chitin in the mucus into chitobios. The bacteria chem attacks to chitobios, but only if they're primed. So they sit out in that aggregate and they prime. And the other thing is that the, the, the migratory path that they're gonna go into is high in nitric oxide, very acidic, and, um, and, and is full in, there's a, there's a um, chitobios gradient created in there. So this aggregation and all of this talking to the host um, that um, Natasha and Philip um, showed uh, does two things. It selects for the symbiote and allows them to be primed to chemotax into the tissue. So what they do is they aggregate on the surface and this is uh, RFP labeled fisheri aggregating into, uh, aggregating and migrating into a crypt or into the tissues. So here's the juvenile light organ landscape. So here's the surface we just talked about. Now what happens? So here are the three pores. What they do is they go into a pore, they go into a nitric oxide rich uh, duct through an antechamber to a bottleneck, and then he, they go into the crypt spaces. So how does this happen across this, you know, 100 microns or so? So one of the key characters in this whole migration is this bottleneck. And this is, the, this is the work of Tara Essek Burns, talented postdoc in the lab. And what uh, Tara showed, um, and this was confirmed by the microbiologists working by different means, showed that on average, a single Vibrio fisheri cell enters the crypts and grows out. And um, she did this beautiful study characterizing the whole migration pathway. And so what she showed is that um, once they get in, through this bottleneck, they go through this big long bottleneck sort of in single file. Once they get in, something happens in this region and it causes that bottleneck to close down almost completely. And so what happens is nobody else can get in and the bacteria that are, the bacterium that has gotten in is, is able to grow out. So the molecule, for those of you who know about microbes, I'm not gonna go into this, but she's finding that the molecule that is responsible for this behavior is the autoinducer of Vibrio fisheri that induces luminescence. Now they constitutively make autoinducer all the time so that when they're in a very tight circumstance going through this bottleneck, the animal seems to sense this autoinducer and causes the, the, um, the bottleneck to close down. What she finds also with the close down is the symbionts are restricted to the crypt spaces. So here's the antechamber here, that bottleneck and all these bacteria in here, and these are actually um, hemocytes. So um, they get this um, restriction uh, of the symbionts. And so uh, this is just showing you each, each area, but it's very small. Um, that restriction can be anywhere um, to, and it's, full of, of cilia, so it's almost um, down to zero. So what Tara has shown is that the bottleneck is the gatekeeper. So on average, as I said, a single cell colonizes and proliferates and the symbiont cells are restricted to the crypts. That is, except every day at dawn. Remember I said there is a circadian rhythm. What happens is every day at dawn, about 90% of the bacteria are vented 
into the surrounding seawater. But before I show you that, I wanna show you the bacteria in the crypt spaces. So just to show you, this was a mixture of red and uh, RFP labeled and GFP labeled bacteria that were given at 50-50 to the animal to show you that in the three crypts, they're pretty well, um, you know, green or red. In other words, a single guy gets in there and grows out. But what um, Tara found was that at every day at dawn, if you look in the hours before dawn or to a non-symbiotic animal and, um, and you're looking at the diameter of the bottleneck, the, the bottleneck of the largest crypt, you see that in a symbiotic animal, it's closed down, it's closed down two hours before dawn, just after, at around the dawn time point, this is at taken at 30 minutes, this bottleneck opens back up and bacteria are released out through the antechamber, out through the duct into the surrounding seawater, about 90% of them. And they, the remaining uh, five to 10% grow up and fill uh, the crypt space again. Um, but what happens is at two hours after dawn or by about then, um, the, 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 that bottleneck has closed back down to restrict the growing population of bacteria. Um, and so the daily rhythm begins. Okay, now what I want to finish by saying that, um, that uh, it's really important to remember that, uh, you know, I'm very, uh, I'm very back uh, animal centric <laughs> as I study the animal, um, but the bacteriologists have been studying the bacteria and they also have really exquisite biogeography. So here is, um, we're, we're using a method called hybridization chain reaction. And this, these are, what is being labeled here is the messenger RNA in each case, or, or the RNA in this case. So this is the, the Lux A gene, and Lux A is the gene that controls luminescence um, in the bacteria. And this was all at night. So the symbionts show pronounced biogeographic patterns. And importantly, this is only across 15 to 20 bacterial cells that they're showing huge, sharp, sharp differences across the crypts. And these vary day to night. So this is nighttime I'm showing you. So Lux A is very abundant and Lux A is making light for the bacteria. Then um, just outside of that, they're, they're um, held within um, uh, uh, very high levels of 16S. Uh, and so the bacteria that are right next to the animal cells are growing. The animal is likely um, feeding them. Um, uh, nutrients through the epithelia. And here, um, this was done by Niall, uh, uh, Kyle Nicolakakis, and um, these are the beautiful images he created. And Sylvia Moriano Gutierrez has been studying this uh, recently, and these are small RNAs, um, and so 16S, and then the small RNAs of, of um, Vibrio fisheri. So I'm going to show you SSRA, which is a gene that does quality control on translation. It is transcribed and then tags um, anything being transcribed that is being mistranscribed. It tags it for degradation. And then SSRS is a stationary phrase, phase gene, and it's a suppressor of transcription in the bacteria. So if you look at this, this movie, you'll see that what Sylvia found is she found that SSRA is, is throughout the center of the crypt spaces and, and as with Luxe, it's not as abundant along the edges. And here's the 16S, um, but SSRA is very, very abundant at night and not so abundant during the day. Then she looked at the stationary phase onset, SSRS. And so what she has is she has 16S around the edge Inside of that, she has SSRA. And then inside of that, she has SSRS. And so this is where um, the light is being produced. So the light is most heavily produced by the bacteria, it would seem, that are truly in deep stationary phase, which, which is amazing. And, and so Ned's lab um, is continuing to study that. So in conclusion then, I hope you're convinced that the onset of this symbiosis, just one host and one microbial species requires a reciprocal, very, very complex reciprocal biophysical and biochemical dialogue 
between the host and symbiote. It's kind of like spy versus spy. Are you the right guy? Yeah, I'm the right guy. Are you sure you're the right guy? And then this interaction is characterized by changes in the transcription of both partners and their cell behavior. And I only showed you transcriptional changes in the host, but we know that there are dramatic transcriptional changes uh, in the bacteria as well. The dialogue results in selection of the specific symbiont and priming for the next step um, and uh, into the exclusive partnership that comes almost immediately. You get a turn down of the immune system and you get all these things happening that create a stable situation. Strain variation is pronounced. Um, and this is something that we've just known in the last few years. And so we're beginning to do, to always test strain variation. Um, and there are differences in aggregation and speed of colonization in these two strains um, and two different types of strains. And it's, it's truly amazing. So with that, um, I'd like to finish. But before I do that, I just wanted to show a picture of a couple of years ago, we had the 30th anniversary of the study of the squid vibrio system and all of the students and postdocs from around the world who could come back and join us to celebrate uh, we did it at Scripps Oceanography because I started this as a postdoc when I was at Scripps Oceanography, when I was um, also doing something else, but um, I wanted to get started on this and then um, recruited into the study, um, Ned Ruby, my partner, um, who I've worked with this on this for 30 years, and, and um, these are his and my students, post, uh, students uh, uh, or academic grand, uh, children and grandchildren um, coming to, to celebrate. And the, we've had generous support um, from agencies um, over the years. And with that, um, I'm going to say uh, mahalo nui loa, <laughs> which is Hawaiian for thank you very much. And this is, this is Hugh Primna at dawn every day. This little guy buries in the sand um, and um, is, is quiescent until dusk when he comes out to forage. So thanks very much. <laughs>